Let's take this to our judge, our senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano, one of the many at the table, this Studio B. Judge, so does this testimony from the aide, Andrew Young's wife, help or hurt? Well, the government obviously thinks that it hurts because the government now can say that uh, it has placed John Edwards within the uh, decision-making process to spend this money. Edwards has two defenses here. One is, I didn't know about this. Andrew Young did it. He was in charge of the money. I had nothing to do with it. The other defense is a little more subtle. The other defense is, any money that we spend in furtherance of the campaign is a lawful campaign expenditure. And keeping this crazy lady quiet would have furthered the campaign. That has never been ruled on by a court. This judge obviously thinks that that type of allegation, should, that type of defense should be decided by the jury because the trial judge has refused to dismiss the uh, indictment. So the Edwards lawyers can turn this testimony that came in earlier today that Jonathan talked about around, and they know how to do it. And, and at issue, though, the significant issue here is whether this money was money to hide from the public or money to hide from John Edwards' wife. Well, if this money, if the if the government can show that Edwards knew about it and the money was used just to save him from embarrassment with his wife, then that would be an improper use of campaign funds for which he's been indicted. But if John Edwards' lawyers can persuade the jury that this was done to further his presidential campaign, the statute is very vague about what you can spend money on. Then there should be a then he should be found not guilty. You've you've said all along that that it's your belief as one who was uh, a judge in the New Jersey Superior Court that this is political. I believe it's a political prosecution. I don't believe that the court should be prosecuting for this. If the Federal Election Commission thinks the money was misspent, fine them, which is the way you ordinarily do it. You don't indict the losing candidate four years after uh, the campaign. Look, he's a tawdry and unlikable, in some minds, despicable human being. It is popular and easy to dump on him, but I don't think he's a criminal. I guess the jury will decide. We got a ways to go here, don't we? Oh, yes, we do. He's probably going to take the witness stand. It'll be riveting. He's a master performer uh, in the courtroom, almost as good as the two gentlemen seated to my left. It'll be, it'll be dynamic to watch him testify. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank well, you. I wish we had cameras in that courtroom, but we do not. Right. It's a federal courtroom. No cameras. But our, our, our folks will certainly be there to bring us the blow by blow. Judge Napolitano, yes. nice to see you. Thank you. Pleasure, Chef. Well, gentlemen, now to the corruption trial against John Edwards that's going on right now in a courtroom. The wife of an ex-aide back on the stand facing tough cross-examination by the defense. Yesterday, she testified that Edwards knew about money from two campaign supporters being used to hide an affair he was having and his love child. Judge Andrew Napolitano, our senior judicial analyst following all of this. Boy, the judge in this case is getting an earful. Well, she is, and so is the jury, and, and, and so are the rest of us. There's so much uh, sexual activity and allegations of inappropriate behavior here. But what's it's, relevant, Judge? Well, what's it's, relevant it's, it's, it's easy to lose case. sight of what's yeah. relevant. What's relevant is what did John Edwards know, if anything, and when did he know it? What was his intention, and what was the intention of the contributors? Take the intention of the contributors and forget about it. One of them is dead, the other is 101 years old, and she's not uh, going to testify. So did John Edwards orchestrate a plan to funnel cash through his campaign in order to keep from his then dying wife the existence of the baby he had with his mistress? Or did workers for John Edwards funnel cash through the campaign in order to keep this information from the public and advance the campaign? Now that is not just a subtle distinction. If this was, although unprecedented, a reasonable campaign expenditure, then it's not illegal. And then he probably wouldn't have been indicted, although you feel this indictment came because he's John Edwards. Well, I, I do, but you know, I'm, I'm not in the courtroom. I've, I've read a lot of, the, of relevant documents. It seems to me that this is such a novel use of this statute. Because you paid a mistress to keep quiet, we're going to indict you. Uh, that, and, and because it's easy to dump on John Edwards, if, if half the allegations about him are true, his behavior is reprehensible, uh, and, and he's wearing, wearing a scarlet letter. So already, to speak. yes, is. yes, already. Uh, if, if he had won his election, his subsequent elections, if he were the vice president of the United States, I don't think we'd be we'd be going through this now. Let me talk to you though about the Youngs. Husband and wife get on the stand for the prosecution and give some details. They're both telling the same story. Right. Uh, Mrs. Young gets very 
very emotional. She has to leave the court yesterday because she has a migraine. Now today in cross-examination, they ask her about medication she's on for migraines. She opened the door on that one by leaving yesterday. And they asked him and her about sleeping medications that he takes that may have fogged their memory. They right. may not have you know, such good memory on these things. Helpful? Remember, whatever you think of John Edwards, he is a master uh, courtroom strategist and in his day was one of the finest and most sought after trial lawyers in the United States. True. So he probably is participating in the strategy. They have a medical expert, a physician, who will come to testify if they deem his testimony uh, it would be helpful and will basically say if you took this medication and this medication and this medication it's going to affect your memory the this this and this are what mr and mrs young took so this is a perfectly acceptable area of cross-examination she's being asked about this now even as we speak isn't it true that you have suffered memory lapses and even some hallucinations because of this medication and if you did how do we know you're not suffering from one when you're testifying to this jury and the jury may say oh, okay we're going to disregard her testimony we're going to disregard parts of his testimony what happens then to the case? Are they the star witnesses? Is this all the prosecution has at this point? If this is all the prosecution has at this point, the, the case will be thrown out at the end of the government's case, in, in my view. And most judges, I think, would, uh, uh, would do that. Uh, if the prosecution has more, then they have to overcome that motion to dismiss and force the defense to put on the case. That will be far and away the more interesting of the two cases. Question. Will former Senator John Edwards take the witness stand and explain his personal life to this jury? If he does, it will be riveting, and you will see a compelling, compelling demonstration of courtroom skills from the witness stand. And you know what? As a, a lawyer as well, I would love to see that. I think most of because us would. He, most of us who watch this for yes, a living. Yes, because as you said, he was an esteemed member of the legal community fighting now to keep his law license. He may need to take the stand. He, Thanks, he, may, he may very well. On the other hand, if the judge does the right thing, she'll say to the prosecutors, no, 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 you guys have overreached Go home. this one. Go There's home. no statute mm -hmm. that expressly prohibits this. And you can't put somebody in jail where the statute isn't clear and precise. Fascinating case. Thanks, Judge. Different Pleasure. perspective Pleasure, on what Jamie. we've been discussing. All right, John, back to you. So it's legal to be slimy, the judge says. Uh, unfortunately, yes. I think he says you could get away with it. <laughs> we have to hear all the facts, though, John. All right. Thank you, Judge, for that. What is the point of filing a Freedom of Information request if the feds send blank pages in return. That's what happened last week when Eric Holder's Department of Justice replied to a media inquiry on the Fast and Furious debacle. They sent a stack of blank documents. Joining us right now is Judge Andrew Napolitano, Fox News Senior Judicial Analyst. The blank pages, insulting, but is that going to get him in trouble? No, that's not going to get him in trouble. Whenever you make a Freedom of Information Act request, the initial response from the government, whether it's the Treasury Department or the Justice Department, never gives you everything. You almost always have to appeal to a federal judge who then looks at the documents in secret and basically says to the government, cough these up. What will get him in trouble is when he fails to comply with a subpoena from the House of Representatives. And that is where there is a very, very serious effort to have a vote by the House of Representatives to ask a federal judge to hold him in contempt. The House can do it alone. Mm -hmm. His Democratic friends in the Senate cannot help him out. And if the House votes to hold him in contempt, they will hire a lawyer to prosecute the attorney general right. before a federal judge. And ultimately, he could wind up going to jail. But I would imagine what uh, Mr. Holder and the Department of Justice judge are trying to do is they're trying to run out the clock, at least past the election. They probably, they probably want to do that. But one of the things that will happen before he is actually prosecuted is the court will look at the documents that uh, Congressman Issa and the House of Representatives have subpoenaed. You mean these and, blank ones we've well, got right well, here? Those and some others, those documents may very well, Steve and Brian, be coughed up before Election Day. The President and the Attorney General probably do not want that to happen. Now, Judge, if you know this, and that's where the process goes, the Attorney General knows this, what could he do, to serve, besides running out the clock and delaying the problem, what could he do to solve this problem? Well, he could comply with the subpoenas, but apparently he doesn't. Is there want a halfway point? Well, I'll give you some of these things. Great question. Yes. 
he could have lawyers for the Justice Department negotiate with lawyers for Congressman Issa's committee and see if there is a halfway point. If you ask Congressman Issa, he will tell you they already had those negotiations, and he will tell you that the, that the Justice Department did not comply with whatever agreements they sort of entered into. When you see someone covet information like this, you wonder what they're hiding. I've not seen it get this serious, Brian, this close to Election Day. Even John Mitchell, Richard Nixon's attorney general who went to jail, was not held in contempt by Congress. Wow. Eric Holder may very well be. We'll stand by for that. All right, We're watching Judge. This Always one. a pleasure. Thanks for the analysis. Sure. All right. Well, there's a new controversy after an Arkansas woman threw out her winning lotto ticket. And she still ended up collecting the $1 million jackpot. We're going to explain this to you. Sharon Duncan says that she chucked the ticket in the garbage after a ticket scanner read out not a winner. So she's like, well, this is garbage. She threw it in the garbage, right? Then Sharon Jones collected the ticket from the trash. She's done this before. She grabbed a whole bunch of them, and she goes back through them, and she got the million dollars. But now a judge is siding with the woman who originally made the purchase. Put yourself in the shoes of these folks, okay? <laughs> judge Andrew Napolitano is our Fox News senior judicial analyst. And I, as I said to him in the break, finders keepers, that's in the Constitution, right? Well, it almost is he in said, the no, Constitution. It's not. I mean, it's the law of the land in all 50 states. This yeah. particular judge... It's tough for me to second guess him because I didn't hear the testimony. But this particular judge in Arkansas apparently wants to change the law, at least in that state. The general law is when you throw something away, when you put it in the garbage, you're giving up your ownership rights to it. Yeah. And if the garbage is in a public place, as unseemly as this is, people may come and go through the garbage and lawfully own what they take out of it. So we have two issues here. One is, can the woman who took the ticket out of the garbage collect on it? She did, yeah. and she spent the money. And then the woman who threw the ticket out didn't sue the lottery commission. She sued the woman who picked through her garbage, and the judge sided with the woman who threw the ticket out. And there's a couple things here. One of them is that the store, there's some discrepancy over whether or not the store had a sign that said, do not take anything out of the garbage. That's one issue. The other issue, in my mind, is that when it's scanned, it said not a winner. So she could also, this original owner of the ticket sue the lottery company and say you know your scanner is invalid it t I had a million dollars and it told me I had nothing absolutely and as a result of my reasonable reliance upon your telling sure. me that I wasn't a winner I threw away a million dollars there for you the that manufacturer started the whole of thing the scanner the chain of action. owe me the million dollars that would be a result consistent with the laws of all 50 states rather than as this arkansas judge has chosen based on the facts in this case to change the law in arkansas i predict there will be an appeal here and a different outcome because this is so radically different. Is it Taking relevant the money at away all from that, the garbage that, the, picker. that the store owner says that this is the super one-stop uh, store manager? She says that she had taped a sign that said, do not take on the garbage can, telling people that they weren't allowed to garbage pick in that store. Uh, the, the woman says that that sign wasn't there at the time. Relevant? Not relevant. I don't think the sign is, uh, is relevant. When yeah. you toss something, you're giving up your ownership. Boy, but more power to her. Be for careful I mean, she what done it you before. put in Takes the garbage. Takes all the tickets and scares them, and then one day, woohoo! Lucky day, million, million dollar bucks winner. Gone. Judge, thank you. Pleasure, Always good Martha. to see you. And I think that finders keepers ought to be maybe amended to the constitution. To the constitution. Yeah, let's work on that. Would you Hammer work on can that get for me? his political friends. I'd <laughs> I, I look for that ticket. You bet I would. Right. And then I want to tell you. Losers weepers. Right. right and then I, I would cash it, and then I would take you out of lunch. Can, but do we have that do, on tape? But only we have lunch. It. We have it. Just lunch. We have Thanks, it. Where's Bill. Where's the lunch? Woo guy over here. We'll pick. <laughs> Meanwhile, cyberbullies beware. Did you hear about this? A 14 year old student in Georgia slapping her classmates with a lawsuit for slamming her on Facebook. To judge under the Palatano, whether she has a case. What do you think? It's very difficult to sue minors. Uh, for their obligations. So they're probably going to have to sue the parents. And in order to prevail against the parents, they're going to have to show that the parents were uh, willfully negligent. That is, they intentionally looked the other way while their kids were doing these things. Now, what did the kids... I would assume the parents knew what the heck they were writing on Facebook. Correct. Or anything else. Correct. What, what it is alleged that the defendants did was to set up a false Facebook page. And on that page had this woman say horrendous things about herself. And as a result, she was embarrassed in front of her classmates, something that could be traumatic for a child. Question, can the school punish the kids for doing that? Answer, under a recent Supreme Court case, yes.
A public school can punish children for their non-school, off-campus behavior if a classmate is harmed or if a school asset is harmed. Classic example uh, right here. Question, can the parents of the girl who was harmed sue Facebook for allowing the false page to be posted by not re requiring proof that it is she who was posting her own Facebook page? Such a lawsuit would be novel, but probably the court would let it go forward. Well, explain this to me, though, Judge. Years ago, before these sites, um, if people were to do the same thing, let's say, you know, put up poster boards or drive by, you know, with sandwich boards or cards, you know, saying this person is a jerk or whatever, I mean, that would have been very clear, right? But now if it's on an electronic site or... Is it different? Or well, is it you know, the federal government has attempted to regulate this, so there is the anti-cyberbullying statute that has prosecuted people who have um, misled viewers about who was saying what on a website. No children have been prosecuted for this, but only adults. Uh, the, the writers of the statute didn't anticipate that children might do this. So it might be a novel use of this statute where a federal prosecutor in Georgia to prosecute these kids for it. But it, it's a bizarre confluence of bullying, which we all know is out of hand, and the use of the Internet to make material misrepresentations, which we all know is out of hand, and to try and find an appropriate remedy for it, for which we don't have one right Could now. Could I say, this is dumb, but when my kids do something or... Uh, which is constant. I'm um, sure you want to say this on air. I, yeah, I probably should think. <laughs> but I, I'll say, or my wife will say, you know, you should apologize to this child. You should apologize to this child. They, they apologize a lot. But, <laughs> but my point is that if, if these particular kids, um, who are a little older here, uh, were to go on Facebook and apologize for those remarks that they made, um, would that be well, a the, way to... to uh, to put this to that is the type of thing that a juvenile court judge, and, and when, when the complainant is a juvenile or the defendant is a juvenile, frequently the proceeding is in secret to protect the, the children from the unwanted glare of publicity. So in a, in a secret court proceeding with the courtroom door locked, having been there, I can tell you, juvenile court judges would appreciate that kind of an apology, even if the family doesn't accept it, because there has to be some end to this. You can't litigate a, a case like this for, for weeks or months or years as if this were uh, IBM suing mobile. Uh, you know, there, there has to be some, some end point, and perhaps an apology uh, is the appropriate end. But I have not seen a case where a minor sued another minor because of cyberbullying. This is virgin territory, Neil. I don't know where it's going to go. Wow. All right. Judge, thank you very, very much. You're welcome. Republicans on a House committee to take the first formal step in holding the Attorney General Eric Holder in contempt of Congress because they say the Attorney General has not handed over all the documents it demanded about Operation Fast and Furious. Justice Department officials say they've been providing documents on a regular basis, but a contempt citation could force them to turn over thousands more. Fast and Furious, of course, is the gun tracking operation that led hundreds of weapons from the United States end up in Mexico. Investigators say two of those guns turned up in Arizona in 2010 at the scene of the killing of the U.S. Border Patrol agent Brian Terry. The Democratic Congressman Elijah Cummings accuses Republicans of playing politics with this Fast and Furious investigation. He writes, Holding someone in contempt of Congress is one of the most serious and formal actions our committee can take. And it should not be used as a political tool to generate press as part of an election year witch hunt against the Obama administration. So there are the two sides. Our senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano, is here with us now. I don't know. Well, this is a very complicated area of, of law. No one in the executive branch of the federal government has been held in contempt of Congress in the modern era, that is, in the post-World War II era. We couldn't find records before that, but it simply hasn't happened in the post-World War II era. So it is likely that this will be resolved in some way. They'll agree to turn over the documents, uh, and it'll be fewer documents than demanded, but more than they wanted to give. But as for the contempt, they are talking about criminal contempt, meaning the House of Representatives would have to persuade the Justice Department to prosecute the head of the Justice Department for violating a federal statute that requires him to comply with House of Representatives subpoenas. That is probably very unlikely to happen. <laughs> that sounds <laughs> to reasonable. Say, to say the least. 
There is such a thing as civil contempt, and that's when a, a, an official violates an order of a court. But there's no judge involved in this yet. So the House of Representatives is probably asking for more than it knows it will get. If, if there were a case before a judge, and they know how to start a case and get it before a judge, and the judge ordered Attorney General Holder to turn over documents, and he didn't comply with that law, then he could be held in contempt. The judge, him or herself, would do it. There, of course, there is politics involved here. Uh, when you're using it as a political talking point, which they are, that makes it part of politics. But that doesn't change what happened and the way this thing was handled. No, but the more politics is involved, the less the courts are going to want to get involved. They're going to see this as, uh, you know, yeah, wa water point. guns across uh, uh, Pennsylvania Avenue rather than something uh, serious. Look, Brian Terry died. This, this fast and furious thing, which started in the Bush administration, has been a disaster from the beginning. And I have seen some of the uh, Justice Department's responses. And were I a neutral judge looking at this, I would say that is not responsive. You did not comply uh, with that subpoena. On the other hand, Congressman Cummings' complaint is legitimate. The Republicans leaked internal documents today before members of the House even saw them, accusing the Attorney General of committing crimes. And now they have to find a prosecutor willing to prosecute. Sometimes the leak is plenty and the prosecutor is not necessary. Well, right. I mean, to the extent that this is political, the, the closer they get to uh, any sort of public humiliation of him, the more likely he is to give them some of the documents that they've been, that they've been asking. I need a percentage, zero to 100, the percent chance in your mind that this man will be prosecuted. Zero. Zero. There you go. Judge Napolitano, thank you. Pleasure. Held hostage for refusing to pay a tip at a restaurant. It reportedly happened at this Houston, Texas restaurant. The manager of La Fisherman, as Brian says, sounds French, locked a party inside and called police when a woman and her five friends didn't leave the 17% gratuity required of parties of five or more. Well, the group claims the restaurant staff didn't deserve the tip. So who is right legally? Let's ask Fox News senior judicial analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano if you can concentrate, because we've had showgirls, we've had tanning women, and Brian's commentary. And we've had this nutty president of uh, Spirit Airlines. Okay, so so now we're on to this. The people did not want to pay the tip. They say the service was horrible. It does say on the menu it's required. Do they have to pay it? Well, there is no specific uh, court ruling on this because the concept of adding automatic tips is relatively new. And as far as I know and as far as our re research could determine, it hasn't been challenged. So the restaurant would say it wasn't really a tip. It was a surcharge. And you knew about it before you ordered the food. That's one argument. The other argument is it has been a custom and tradition in this country for hundreds of years. You like the service, you leave a tip. You don't like the service, you just pay the bill and go. And the amount of, of the tip is up to your own choosing. Who is this restaurant to change this very well ingrained tradition here? But I'll tell you what the restaurant cannot do it cannot arrest these people well, and hold them against their will. So apparently, they locked the doors and called the police. Locking the doors would also prevent other people from leaving. That's called false imprisonment. It's like you invite me to your uh, party and I say something that you didn't like and you want to get me back. You don't let me leave. You lock the doors. Only if you bring good wine. All right, I'll bring the good wine. <laughs> but, but that is what's called a false imprisonment. It's not a crime, but you have a cause of action. You can sue the person who prevents you from leaving and the police ought to have known that. But here's the thing, apparently, the restaurant itself is on the record as saying, we've called the police several times before for situations like this. Do the police have the duty to respond to something that may or may not be a crime? Pol police today are taking the position that they will respond to all calls that they get and that a dispatcher will not make the determination of who's right or who's wrong, but the police on the scene will. And it's probably a lot better and a lot safer for the person calling and the person about whom the call is made to deal with police officers on the scene than expecting a dispatcher on the phone to decide. But once getting there, the police should have said, you know what, this has nothing to do with the law, this has nothing to do with public safety, this has nothing to do with the cops. Let them go. If they don't pay the bill, sue them. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is that the family felt pressured, so they did pay the 17% because they wanted to get out the door. Think about what's going to become of this restaurant in Houston. I don't think it's very popular this morning. Maybe not. Uh, Judge <laughs> Andrew Napolitano, always popular. Promise not to lock me in your house? Uh, I can't <laughs> promise that just yet. I like you too much. Uh, have a great weekend. You. you too, Gretchen. Okay. <laughs> 
Some new information now on wiretapping. Statistics from the Justice Department showing the Obama administration has increased the number of applications to install wiretaps on suspected terrorists, spies, and their associates by roughly 10% over the last two years. Is it making America any safer? Chief Washington correspondent James Rosen live in D.C. with that. James? John, good morning. These new numbers on wiretaps have surfaced at a time when the Obama administration is pressing Congress to renew certain spy powers that are set to expire at year's end. These latest figures released by DOJ earlier this week show a distinct rise from 2010 to 2011 in the number of applications for court orders that the Obama administration has made to a special panel of 11 federal judges known as the FISA Court after the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. All of these requests were approved, although two were withdrawn, and all but 69 of them were for electronic surveillance. National security officials say FISA has been an essential tool in the war on terror, including the effort to neutralize al-Qaeda over the years, but they caution that the rise of FISA wiretaps in 2011 was not attributable to the famous raid on Osama bin Laden's Pakistani compound, nor to any specific operation. They also note that at their high point back in 2007, as you can see, these figures edged toward 2,400 in one year. Officials told Fox News the intelligence community is only now fully accustomed to the changes to the law that President Bush signed in 2008. Now, Title VII of the FISA law is set to expire at year's end. It allows the targeting of categories of non-U.S. citizens abroad without the need for a court order for each individual target. Attorney General Eric Holder recently told the Senate this provision is, quote, critical to our national security. And so the administration strongly supports the reauthorization, and as you indicated, hopes that it occurs well before the end of the year, so that uh, the certainty that is needed by uh, our, the men and women who are in our intelligence community will have some degree of um, assuredness that those tools will remain there and that our fight against those who would do harm to the United States uh, can continue. The FISA court was created as a post-Watergate measure to strengthen oversight of wiretapping and other surveillance techniques used both here and abroad. John. James Rosen in D.C. for us. James, thank you. Well, there is a lot of information there. So for more on this, we're going to bring in Judge Andrew Napolitano, a Fox senior judicial analyst with us. And you're smiling because uh, I, my first question for you has to do with losing privacy to the government. And you and I were talking, we'll never know if they're even looking at us. Well, that is, uh, that is correct, Harris. And uh, James has done a great job in, in getting his arms around the numbers here, which are truly staggering. There are other numbers that are not a part of this report that are part of this program, and those are self-written search warrants where FBI agents don't go to the FISA court but authorize themselves to examine information, not from you but about you, your banking records, your computer records, your telephone records, your medical records, your legal records. If you take all of this together, what they're going to the FISA court and the FISA court is letting them get and what they get on their own if they whatever they obtain on individuals if they don't use it in a prosecution against those persons mm -hmm. then they never know that they have been a target that's amazing and and i don't even want to think about where all that information stays or goes or whatever you you bring us and i, I was reading some notes on this from you because you write about this a lot we should tell people uh, this is an important topic you say that we should know about but you bring us to a point where you say we're moving dangerously close to what we fought against in the cold war and in world war ii well, what do you mean well one of the if you listen to the uh, language of Ronald Reagan in the years that he was running for president when we were still fighting the Cold War and he was challenging the moral authority and the legal authority of communist governments to suppress the rights to take away the privacy uh, of the of the people in their countries we are now getting closer to permitting our own popularly elected government to do to us the very things that communist governments in uh, Eastern Europe and in Soviet Russia did to their people and against which we fought a Cold War basically removing their sense of dignity and privacy and putting us under a totalitarian microscope where the government watches everything we do. So what do you say to the pushback that it's a good cause, it's for a good cause, it's to keep us safe from terrorism? You know, maybe some Americans would say they would cede some of their privacy rights if it's for that cause. Uh, I say a couple of things. The Constitution doesn't permit it. And the Constitution was written by people who had suffered terribly under the King of England, and they didn't even obviously have technology in those days. And I also say your personal dignity should be of great value to you. And there's an area of human behavior that quite simply is none of the government's business.
but the government is making its business. If people don't cry out against it, the government will know everything about it. You know us. what? You bring me to my last question, and it has to do. Yesterday afternoon, I'm in my office and I'm watching the Associated Press wires. This goes by relatively quietly. Why don't we hear more about this? Because a lot of people have accepted the myth that when the government invades our privacy, it somehow keeps us safe. It doesn't keep us safe. It puts tremendous personal private information in the hands of people who could misuse it. It also doesn't keep us free because it, it mm. exposes our innermost behavior, what we do in the kitchen, what we do inside the house, to the peering eyes of government. And the Constitution does not trust the government with that information. And I've so learned from you about context. When you take things out of context, they're sometimes inexplainable, no matter what it is that we're doing, which is a great lesson. Nice Judge, to chat with you. Thank you Pleasure. very much. John? The self-proclaimed mastermind of the worst terrorist attacks on American soil is set to be arraigned tomorrow for a second time more than 10 years after the attacks of 9-11. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and four others are accused of conspiring to organize, train, or funnel money to the hijackers who flew planes into the World Trade Center, the Pentagon and a Pennsylvania field back on September 11, 2001. Back in 2006, the administration of President George W. Bush brought the men to the Navy base at Guantanamo for a military trial. But President Obama put a stop to it in an effort to get the men tried in a civilian court. Of course, Congress squashed that effort, and now we're back to a military trial. And legal experts say if the defendants plead not guilty, it could possibly give KSM the opportunity to detail the harsh interrogation techniques used to break him, techniques the Obama administration call torture. Greg Jarrett with the news. He's live in the New York newsroom. Greg. And Trace, for that very reason, prosecutors may choose to avoid presenting evidence gathered through interrogation, including any confession. They likely have enough other incriminating evidence. But when Congress blocked trying KSM and his four co-defendants in federal courts here in the U.S., it may have actually done Eric Holder's Justice Department a big favor. Why? Under federal rules, evidence gathered without search warrants, Miranda rights, or legal counsel is inadmissible in federal courts. And so is all other evidence derived therefrom, but not so in a military tribunal. Now remember, KSM was not captured on American soil, then told he could remain silent while given a lawyer. He was an enemy combatant seized on the battlefield of terrorism in Pakistan. There were no search warrants politely handed to him at the door. And in fact, the case of Ahmed Ghilani is very instructive. He was the first and only Gitmo detainee to be tried in civilian court. And the judge tossed out critical evidence leading to an acquittal on 285 charges. Ghilani was convicted of only one charge, and his was considered the easiest of all the Gitmo cases. However, the rules of military tribunals are not as strict as federal rules, but will they be fair? The chief prosecutor at the military commission said this, and I'll quote, the tribunal incorporates all the fundamental guarantees of fairness and justice that are demanded by our values. It also far exceeds the applicable international law standard. One other issue, Trace, the last time KSN was in court, that was late 2008, he and his co-defendants tried to plead guilty. But when President Obama took office a couple of months later, he put a stop to it. Well, we may learn tomorrow whether these accused terrorists are inclined to plead guilty yet again or face trial. Trace? Greg Jarrett, live for us in New York. Greg, thank you. Joining us now, Fox News senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano. Judge, it's great to see you. I mean, you go back to what Greg was saying. Is this make or break for these military commissions? Well, yes and no. I mean, this is the beginning of a long, long process, which no doubt will involve appeals and ultimately, and it's rare for a military case to make its way to the Supreme Court, ultimately an appeal there. I have seen, these are public documents, uh, Trace, the motions that the civilian lawyers for the defendants have filed seeking the dismissal of these charges, and they basically make the standard constitutional arguments, many of which were just nicely outlined uh, by Greg, which distinguish military tribunals from civilian tribunals. Stated differently, <laughs> these lawyers are challenging the constitutionality of the rules that Congress established for the trial of these cases. And don't be surprised if they win a few of these motions, not a great deal of yeah. them, but a few of them.
Yeah, and, and I was kind of looking at your talking points, Judge, and as a constitutional scholar and a legal scholar, this has got to be fascinating for you to see the issues that this trial will raise. I know the trial still a ways off, but the issues are going to be just fascinating to watch. Well, we have not had these types of issues raised in the modern era, say in, in the in the post-World War II era. The last time there was a commission of this magnitude trying uh, people of this notoriety was during uh, World War II, and the evidence was pretty clear. They were Nazi saboteurs. They were arrested on American soil. The only issue was should they be executed or not because two of them it turned out were born in the United States. But here you have things like can evidence obtained not by the torture of these people but by other people who are not defendants in the case be used? Can hearsay be used? Can the defendants have some of the evidence and even some of the witnesses kept away from them in order to protect the sources of those witnesses and that evidence? Here's one for you. If they're acquitted, Unlikely, but if they're acquitted, can they still be incarcerated? Right. These are rules that are alien to American ears, that are very different from what we're accustomed to in this country, that will be tried out in these tribunals, and ultimately appellate courts will decide if those rules are close enough to the constitutional standard to permit any conviction to, to stay. I just want you to backtrack, backtrack, if you would, for me, Judge. Punished after acquittal. I mean, what does that mean? The Military uh, Commissions Act that established the present court. This is the third act. So the one that is in, is in existence now permits the President of the United States to incarcerate any of these people for the rest of their lives, even if they're found not guilty, on the theory that they would return to, as Greg says, the battlefield and would begin harming Americans and American interests again. This is a claim that no American president has ever asserted. This is a claim that Senator Barack Obama criticized when he voted against the Military Commissions Act, probably never anticipating that he would one day be the president and would be asked to enforce this. Judge Andrew Napolitano, Judge, thank you. It's great to see you, sir. Pleasure, Trace. Differences in cultures. Joining me now to sort out this uh, whole question is Fox News senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano, and host of Varney and Company on Fox Business Network, Stuart Varney. So, gentlemen, I, uh, I've always thought of myself as an ethical man, but I'm, I've always had trouble from the time, and at the time the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act was passed, I was working for one of the big international CPA firms, and they told us to look for these, these, these payments right. uh, under the table. And, I, and at the same time, I thought, but wait a minute, fees are paid to the Port Authority of New York to dock. What's the difference between that and paying Mr. Fujimoto at the dock of Tokyo to, to unload your goods there? It seemed like the same kind of practices, but... The law says it's not. Judge? Well, the government wants to give the impression that it is law-abiding and others are not when the same behavior is engaged in. So, for example, in the Walmart case in Mexico, with which I think you're going to speak with Stuart uh, in a moment, uh, the government may very well argue that if Walmart paid local authorities bribes to do what they ought to have done anyway, basically approve the standardized construction of a box store using cinder block and materials that would be approved anywhere in the country, the government should somehow prosecute that when the government itself gives bribes to foreign countries every day every day of the week they just call it foreign aid it's basically cash given to the leader of a country so as to make things easier for the american government well i'll even all right so there's the foreign the foreign aid as you call it wink wink right uh, but there's also if i have a problem and i need to get a permit in my local community or even if I have a, a national company and I need something done across the country, I call up my lobbyist and I say, would you go make campaign contributions to my, to my local official? What's the difference? There is no difference. Now, obviously, what we're talking about here is a contradiction between the way we actually act within the United States and the way the government acts within the United States and how we are supposed to act as a private enterprise company when, uh, when working overseas. There is a contradiction between the two, and it absolutely doesn't make moral sense. However, this law is in place. It's a very, co a very complex law, I think, and a judge will, I think, back me up on that one. It is. And therefore, given its complexity, I think it is politically applied. And I think it's being applied politically in this case, so because we, the, the left 
hates Walmart. So go after Walmart, get them on a technicality about the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and nail them. And I think that's what's going on. Well, it, uh, there is a, a, a group, I think it's a small group that is anti-Walmart. And of course, this does give them fodder. But at the same time, let's go back to the law, because again, I, I'm, I'm convinced that laws should only be enforced or are enforceable if they are rational and the public accepts them. What was the purpose behind this act? Was it to to give cover to you, the American businessman, so that when you do business overseas, you can say to them, I, I'd love to pay you your, your, your bribe, but I can't because I'll get in trouble at home. Well, I, I think that the purpose of the act probably was, was somewhat pure, and that was to, to assure that foreign laws were applied fairly to Americans rather than only to those who could pay for the, uh, for the enforcement of them. The problem, as, as Stewart points out, is the more complex the law, the more discretion the government has to enforce it. Question. This law they now want to enforce against Walmart, would they enforce it against fill in the blank, Solyndra, if it still existed, some company favorable to the administration? I think this law came out of the 1970s. It I did. think it involved a, some kind of scandal, a bribery scandal by an American company operating in Latin America. It was very bad publicity for American business. And so they said, right, we're going to be high tone moral right. here. Don't do that again. But, but Here's typical the law. overreaction. Here's the what, yes. part, go ahead. A typical overreaction, a typical reordering of American values and priorities yes. in response to a couple of incidents that outraged well, the public, then, then about which up, we've now all forgotten. Then you wind up with bad law. And the problem right. is, can you imagine any member of Congress saying, let's undo the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act? Who's, a, who's for corruption? Nobody is. Right. But I had a call on the radio show from a guy named Terry from Puerto Vallarta. And he called, he was listening, we were talking about this, and he said, this is the, the way everything is done in Mexico. You, you know how you could undo this statute? With a simple one word, uh, one line uh, added to it. This statute shall apply to the government. Because the government then, in order to avoid the, the sting of its own statute, Good. would stop enforcing it against private individuals. I, you're, you're right, but I've got to go back to but the... But that's not going to happen. No, of course it's not going to happen. <laughs> oh, yeah, come on, Judge. <laughs> Let's get real here. I've got to go back to the politics of it, though. There is always going to be, with this kind of law in place, which I agree that you could never get rid of, you could never repeal it, you can't do that. It's right. always going to be there. It offers opportunity for selective political prosecution. Yes. The left, you say it's a small group that doesn't like Walmart. I disagree, Tom. I think it's a very large group and a very important group that disagrees and does not like Walmart, and that is the union movement. Well, the union true. movement is closely aligned true. with the Obama administration. Oh, what a coincidence that now the Obama administration's Justice Department is going after Walmart for the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act against Walmart, which doesn't have a union. So so then, oh, is that oh, that's why I'm so troubled about the morals and ethics of this whole story, because of the fact that it seems like it is... Uh, selectively enforced. Oh, look, the morals, the, and the, ethics, writ large. The, the morals and the ethics of the story may even be worse than first appeared. These alleged bribes took place several years ago. Question, why is the New York Times revealing it on the cusp of a presidential election campaign? Well, and and the other part I think should be pointed out is that Walmart and their internal audit system, they're the ones who discovered these payments the, that were made that were questionable and brought themselves to the SEC and to the law enforcers and said, we, we may have a problem here. They turned themselves in on this. Yes. Here's, may I make a forecast? I don't think that they will be successfully prosecuted over many, many years. This is going to take years. I don't think there'll be a successful prosecution under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. But there will be political hay made against them between Precisely. now and November 6th. And that's all the government wants. I think there will be a successful prosecution because they covered up the investigation and the results of that investigation, which they did internally. That is the, is the that, big that, chink in the armor of Walmart at this point. A cover-up is always the big problem. But again, going back to the fact that is this a political haymaker or not, it may be with the, with the union leaders because they're not happy with Walmart because they're not union. But when you go to community to community to community, whether it's Chicago or Inglewood, California, wherever it might be, the people say, please bring in Walmart. They bring low prices. They provide jobs. And in Mexico, it's a perfect example. They are the biggest private employer in the country Can of I Mexico. Can I tell you that right? the most sophisticated person in this building who is seated to my left now yes. shops at Walmart? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, so everybody likes uh, quality that you recognize well, at low prices. Except there's another group out there, and that is the, the, the small town city council person who says, wait a minute, Harry's 
uh, you know, building shop down the street or the hardware store or right. Mary's dress shop is going to be put out of business because they come in and they undercut the prices. But does anybody so, complain about prices being too low? Wait a second. Let me suggest the following. Maybe Walmart knew what it was doing and considered this a cost of doing business. You've got to do this to get into Mexico. They've got 2,000 stores in Mexico, not under the Walmart name. They've got 2,000 operations. Maybe they said, OK, we've got to get in. We'll pay this to get in. It's going to be very profitable once we are and in. This is, this uh, is, we're quite prepared to take the heat on the foreign corrupt practices. And this is the problem I had. I was a young man right out of college working for this big CPA firm, and, and I saw payments to dock masters around the world for companies to, uh, with, that will go nameless to, to basically unload their goods. I, and I, yet I saw the same payments to the Port, of, Port Authority of New York. The very phrase that Stuart used, cost of doing business, actually enhances the punishment if the, if the defendant claims that as a defense or a motivation. Why? Well, they because wouldn't claim it publicly they, as well, a, well, they well, wouldn't well, say that. They, they wouldn't say it, but it would appear as, as such in, in their books. I mean, for example, were the bribes listed in such a way that they were ordinary reasonable business ex expenses and therefore deductible for income tax purposes? That would be considered a cost of doing business whether Walmart's people declared it as such or but not. In the or the penalty is enhanced for doing you, it You that cannot way. deduct illegal payments. Correct. Or we make $24 million worth of payments to get this deal done. Let's expand vigorously because we know we'll get $124 million worth of profit having paid the $24 million in the first place. And that's why that's the done. cost of doing business. And that's right. the phrase that will make the jail time longer if there is jail time for anybody. Heaven forbid, Judge. Agreed, Heaven Stewart. forbid. Agreed, but we don't run the Justice Department. No. Lamentably. It, it, there may be a change in the running of the Justice <laughs> Department in six months' time, let us yes. hope. May I say that? That's another whole show. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> At least one. Gentlemen, always great to have your opinion. <laughs> Pleasure.